I am Debbie Wilson, the director of the Cool Climate Enology for the Culture Institute. And I'm pleased to welcome you today uh, for the presentation as part of the ongoing Covey Lecture Series. This afternoon, we're excited to welcome Dr. Kevin Kerr, Principal Consultant and Founder of KCMS Applied Research and Consulting, and longtime Covey Professional Affiliate and Research Associate. Kevin, I think you were actually in the first group that became a professional affiliate uh, right. with Covey. Uh, Kevin is an internationally recognized specialist in research and advisory services for the grape and tender fruit uh, production, along with integrated pest management for those crops. He earned his Bachelor of Science in Agriculture and Master of Science in Environmental Biology at the University of Guelph, Bachelor of Education at the University of Western Ontario, and PhD at Guelph University. Kevin has delivered seminars and research results across Canada and the US and internationally, including Australia, China, and New Zealand. He's been a busy man over the years. He has authored and co-authored fact sheets, grower articles, workbooks, and seminars for government agencies and the academic community, and has previously lectured in the Enology and Viticulture Undergraduate Program here at Brock. In terms of research, Kevin started the initial uh, vine winter hardiness research uh, with colleagues at Covey and contributed to the Institute's Vine Alert uh, program. He has completed multiple research projects for the National Research Council of Canada, and one of his key research programs involved the multicolored Asian lady beetle and the impact on grape and wine quality. So with that, please join me uh, in uh, welcoming Kevin to give us a talk today. Thank you, Debbie, and to everyone who's out in that other world. Uh, it's kind of a having to remember that the, the uh, internet exists now. And when I was asked to, to do a presentation as part of the affiliate program, and I was uh, thinking back many times that the presentations I've given have been very project oriented. And I thought about it this time and said, well, sometimes we forget what people had done before us. And so I thought, well, I'm gonna do a little retrospective, as, as I call it, and, and kind of think that we'll go to, uh, maybe let's take a look back at what happened over the last 40 years. And that's, that's my window of observation. <laughs> there were things done before, but uh, to date myself, it would be, well, 45 years ago this summer that I started my first experience in pest management or the understanding of pests associated with grapes along with other crops as a student. And what I wanted to get across is to think about if we have to remember how we got to where we are today. Many of us are so tied into electronics and instant information. Back in the 70s, that really didn't exist. And when you put it in perspective, there was an awful lot of people who laid the foundation work for us. Uh, IPM back in the, in the 70s really emerged from the 60s looking at, okay, we can't stay on the, the pesticide treadmill. We have to think differently. So I was lucky enough as a, as a naive undergrad to get attached to a building where there were multiple research uh, entities present. Agriculture Canada and Vineland was probably the foremost location in Canada when we were looking at tree fruit and grape uh, pest research. Housed in one building, and I, I mean, looking at a university now with many diverse departments and people and everything else, but let's go back almost 50 years and imagine in one building you had multiple entomolo entomologists, plant pathologists, virologists, nematologists, pesticide application engineer. They were looking at pesticide and sprayers back in the 70s. And then what I call the true people that I, I learned over time to appreciate even more so. And they were what I call the true biologists. They were the ones who decided to look at the crop as a whole entity. We couldn't just look at a particular insect and we couldn't just look at a particular disease and separate it from everything else that went into the production practice. We had to also understand what else was there with, what else was present with it at the same time. Why were certain beneficial insects present? Why did diseases seem to be suppressed by certain plants that were nearby? Odd things that 
that at the time when you're an undergrad, you're so focused on the book and whatever little tidbit of information they give to you. And suddenly I was forced to, to open my eyes and look at everything else because they would often ask me questions after I had visited vineyards. What else did you see? Well, you sent me up to look for Great Bering Roth. No, what else did you see? And I think that's really, really something important that we lose sight of at times. We get so narrowed and so focused. Next door to where I was working, I was lucky. There was HRIO Vineland, which was the Hort Research Institute of Ontario. I had a person there involved in grape breeding, Dr. Ollie Bratt, and followed up by Helen Fisher. There were people doing soil nutrition, such as Bob Klein, soil science, looking at irrigation. And all of these people worked together. They knew each other in both buildings, and they went back and forth. And then beside them was the Extension Service building, and I jokingly refer to them as the translators. These were the people at the very beginning that took the technical information and put it into a user-friendly format in, in today's lingo. I call it translating the technical into the commercial. And that's something that we, again, have to really take a look at. And then there were people across Canada that I got to meet through all of this. And as well, Brock got into the game later on, but there was also contributions at that time, even by the marketing boards and other affiliates. So people realized it had to be a group effort, not working alone and being able to, you know, uh, you had to function collegially. And what was very interesting is if thinking now with uh, NSERC or any of the funding projects, they want to see you reaching out and have multi, you know, multiple, multiple tentacles out where so there's all these people feeding into one spot. They were doing that without being told. And so I, I think it's something to be aware of. How did the information get out? Most of the time it was one-on-one -on -one discussions with farmers or they would have some farm demonstrations. And for those that remember way back, there was a, there was a book called Publication 360. Now, when I first started in the extension service in the early 80s, that was called the spray calendar. Didn't matter what else was in there, that was the spray book. That's where they went. If you gotta do something, that's where I'm gonna find it. Yes, they had their conventions, as they still do, and they also produced newsletters. The dilemma with newsletters at that time, they weren't instant, they came across on your computer. This was a put it out, print it, duplicate it, copy it, fold it, put it in an envelope, stick a, a postage stamp on it, mail it to you, and it got there two weeks after you really needed it. So <laughs> it just showed that sometimes the communication was hard. Vineland also had a unique thing developed called the agrophone. The agrophone was an interesting, going old school again, imagine while even on your voicemail now, you have a time limit. We were given a three minute little tape and we had to talk about every crop and every pest and everything that was going on and condense it into a three minute message and if you didn't get it all done before you hit the final beep, you had to start over again. Now that became a real trick. And then you turned to talk really fast because you had to get this thing done. So you had to, like, it was crazy. We thought we'd gone to heaven when we could finally get it so you could actually select <coughs> the different crops on this agrophone. We had night school for growers. Again, uh, the eight separate Tuesdays in the winter and they would come in and we would walk all the way through whatever happened the previous season and what we thought was coming up. So outreach was really important and something that was required. But we also began, and, and that was the time of the beginning of what we call regional IPM. Before it was research oriented and then the next move was to collecting information and then making it available to the growers at large. So one of the first things you had to do was you started to think about training of summer students and scouts and allowing them to work across the province. Part of the reason is that we wanted them to be able to look and report information consistently. A great challenge that we all have is that relative terms are a challenge. Few is how many to so many different people? Many, a lot. No, we had to get them to learn how to quantify, follow the same strategy and process and protocol and get that information back and forth. We also began diagnostic clinics. And those diagnostic clinics were the first, what I call big outreach. Instead of just running them at the research station, there was actually, uh, for grape growers and others, in Virgil, on every Tuesday, 
from 9 until 12, we went down and we took microscopes and people could bring samples into us. So now we were getting the grower community to start looking and walking through their own blocks to come and bring issues to us that we could identify with greater uh, a degree of accuracy. Field trials were going on, and what's happened in the past bit? Look at industry, the university, everywhere. Web pages have, have blown up all over the place. People have blogs, people have Zoom meetings, whether good or bad, Zoom can, you can, that's your own. Phone apps, where you can take a picture and suddenly decide, is it this or is it that? What's the next imagination? I, I what I have seen from where it was very different to where it is now and the changes I see, I'm sure the next wave is coming. Now it's up to your group and the ones going forward. I'm, I'm sitting back watching because uh, I'm, I'm moving towards that area where I don't think outside the box near as much as I probably should. So monitoring changes. Well, it really was all around boots on the ground. You had to go out and you had to go to take a look. And no, this is not a picture of me when I first started. We do get people started early looking for stuff. And this happens to be a colleague of mine, Ryan Brewster, his son, uh, taken a number of years ago. We thought, yeah, he, he's in training. He's getting ready to do the, do the job of the future. But then we had to think about using other techniques. So we started to look at the use of synthetic sex pheromones and sticky traps. The very first trap that I was involved with, believe it or not, was a plastic pail filled with a mix of honey and water with a little cone on the top of it stuck out in a vineyard and you hoped something would fly into it. Then you started to count what was there. Well, we got better in that we could tie, try and decide what pests we wanted to find and utilize the techniques that we could. Then we went to weekly site visits, realizing that the continuity of information was as critical as any information. If you only see it once, you have a snapshot in time. If you see it over a multiple number of weeks, you can now establish trends and determine whether have there been changes? Has it escalated? Has it de-escalated? Is it really a problem? And then we moved into, for visual insects, then we had to think about diseases and managing those. Leaf wetness monitoring and modeling. Now leaf wetness monitoring, I have to get you to visualize this because I couldn't find a picture of the old piece of equipment. How did we determine whether a leaf was wet or dry? Believe it or not, imagine a circular item and it's called a DeWitt leaf wetness recorder. And it employed the really high tech thing called cotton string. And it was under tension and it went to a needle that would record. Well, what happens to cotton string when it gets wet? It stretches. What happens to cotton string when it gets dry? It shrinks. And we would follow these little <laughs> blips on a, on a machine to determine were the leaves wet or were the leaves dry. Why? Because the very beginning using temperature models was starting and we could start to say, was it wet long enough for the disease to actually go through an infection period? This is pretty rudimentary now. There is so much high tech stuff out there that you can stick in there, artificial leaves and everything else, but that's where we started. But the idea was there. We said, how do we measure something that we can't really see we want to be able to understand it to a greater degree. And I would say the pathology advancements really moved pest management, especially in Ontario and across Canada, uh, far ahead. We could validate what was going on because models were brought in from all over the world. And Wendy McFadden-Smith, who I have give, also given credit to on this because we worked together so long, realized you had to validate these models under local conditions because sometimes what works in Ontario is not the same as what was working in California where the model was developed. We had one with Downey Mildew looking at uh, a model and the one from Europe was not applicable under Ontario conditions. Yet companies were selling pre-programmed pieces of equipment saying follow this when we tell you what to do when in fact they really weren't following the local conditions. So these are the things where research really comes big into play that we have to follow through. And finally, we got down to the point of being able to look at specific blocks. Grape growers are not unlike any other farmer. I want to treat everything at once if I can. Getting them to switch the attitude to saying, no, you don't need to treat this block. You only need to treat this or this. When you have to control grape berry moth, you don't need to spray everything. You can do perimeter sprays. 
Those were big changes that came along, but it took a long time to get there. And as I said, where we started and where we are now there are two different things. The last one is to talk a little bit about some of the changes were pesticide application techniques. Calibrating equipment was a big one. Right now, what is the latest on the front? Sensors. And it's what they do, they monitor the plant. They monitor where the leaves are. They know where to focus the spray. They know how to apply the pesticide at the optimum way. We can recycle plant uh, materials. We don't lose pesticides. All of these things were, were huge advances, but it was the ability to monitor and follow, monitor where things were going. We tried to monitor drift. And now we've moved in, and Sue and others, you're looking at aerial imaging, satellite imaging. What can that tell us? People are now looking at drones. You know, we can cover a greater area. I've seen some tremendous visuals of aerial uh, drone work. The challenge that you have to remember with this is that still, ultimately, we can have equipment, and AI, I guess, is moving there, but look at this, assess it, evaluate it, and then we still have to truth it. We have to ground truth. The other dilemma that I think may, may come up with drones, more so in the Niagara area, is that uh, if you buy a drone now and you want to do some of this, there's a lot of places you're not allowed to fly it. <laughs> and anybody who's bought a new drone and tried to do any work around the Niagara District Airport suddenly finds out that their drone won't fly. So it's, it's uh, yet if you talk to a few growers have really old stuff, you can still find, <laughs> it's the old line, find the old ones that aren't knocked down by technology. But that's something we have to take into account. So we may think this is great, but we may also be restricted for other reasons. And finally, the advanced diagnostics that are coming along. I look at the, the work that SUD's doing and, and out in BC and everywhere. I mean, it's, this is tremendous stuff. This is needed. Uh, we were doing some of it back in the 70s with Dr. Diaz, but not to the, to the degree that was going on now. And the recognition of clean plant material and the requirements for it, huge. I mean, we, we had an opportunity, we sort of fumbled it away, but now we're trying to get back that opportunity again from my estimation, about 30 years after the fact, which is unfortunate, but uh, we have learned a little bit of, of something that we, maybe we could have done. There were a large number of insect pests and, and diseases that were present in the 70s, but if you went to the books and looked at them, they, these, this was it. You certainly weren't thinking about everything else. If you were a grape grower in the 70s, looking at the varieties that were present, this was it, the big ones. And in fact, botrytis was really only an issue with some of the certain hybrids at the time. Uh, the one that I, the two that I will remember will be Seval and 23512. But outside of that, a bunch of the other hybrids, botrytis was not an issue. So, you know, we didn't didn't think about it on Foch or Baco or anything like that. So again, it was even a slightly smaller group. But this is what what we were looking at, and it's pretty rudimentary and. Like I said, on, on your, what would be your upper left will be, that's great barrier moth adult and the pheromone trap just beside it. To the right would be the beginnings. The first thing we would see in the spring would be Phomopsis cana leaf spot. And then the lower left is downy mildew and then powdery mildew and then black rot and finally botrytis. So there was a, a sequence to the season, but we didn't have to be overly complicated at the time. And this made life reasonably easy in the late seventies to teach people because the more you give them to look for, the more you get confused. And I fit into that category very quickly. Uh, some people have asked me over time, how do you remember A, B, and C? I said, well, if you do it for 40 years, it's amazing how much actually gets stuck up in the noggin and you can actually bring it back out. But it's remembering to say, okay, what are we looking for? The biggest issue that we had in teaching anyone to go out there, don't specifically look for it look for what is different. That's easier to pick out. If you start to search for something, you can get so focused in, you don't see anything. And if all of a sudden you let yourself go back and say, what is the odd looking part of this? Odd color, odd shape, odd position, odd uh, type of thing. Now you start to be able to see stuff and then you can quantify things. This was probably one of the biggest changes and I was around when it happened. Debbie was around when it happened. The 1980s, and the two pictures kind of show it. The top one was after 1988, when the Free Trade Agreement came in and the Wine Content Act and the establishment of VQA. 
thousands upon thousands upon thousands of acres of grapes were emerging. It was probably a few of the most difficult years personally to watch what people had been working on for lifetimes suddenly go under the guise of just a lopper, cut it off, spray it with Roundup to kill the suckers and take it out. But resiliency came along, people came back, they replanted. But what happened was there was a shift. They said, if we're going to stay in this game, and I shouldn't really call it a game, stay in this business, we're gonna to have to adapt. And they did. Vinifero began to be planted, but suddenly memory of an old time pest that was always here in North America, Phylloxera, we have to use rootstocks. This was a new thing for a lot of growers. They weren't ready for it. They were too used to being able to use own, own rooted vines, stick them in the ground, something died, layer a cane across and go. This was a whole new game. Also, at that time in pest management, we had to rely, we were still relying pretty much on broad spectrum products. And it doesn't sound too correct, but I will call it, it's almost a scorched earth policy. In other words, kill it all. I'm not gonna worry too much about it and keep it clean. Well, these products were starting to be removed from the marketplace. Plus, we had realized that they were becoming a problem because suddenly they weren't controlling everything that we thought they were. Things were creeping up on us. So we had to adapt the pest control also to match the cultivar changes. Suddenly, once Vinifer got here, things became a lot different. The old style of spraying maybe four, maybe five times a season, suddenly, infection periods and susceptibility of them dramatically changed. We had to realize that, no, we had to protect them a lot longer. So what happened here? So if we look at it, the changeover from organophosphates, that's a positive in my opinion, because we had to. Pyrethroids were present. We had to start adapting away from them as well, because they were just too wild. We also had to learn that vinifera was more susceptible for a longer period of time to multiple diseases and suddenly old time pests that we hadn't really thought about suddenly loved vinifera grapes. So we had to figure out how to deal with it. As well along with this, with pest management, we suddenly were getting new fungicides in that had the ability to stick, to enter the plant tissue, to allow us to, after very shortly after an infection period, control a disease, as well as give us forward protection even if it poured rain. Huge, huge changes, because now we could plan to a greater degree. But along with this, suddenly what rears its head that we really hadn't run into was all of a sudden the winter of 1993 came along and it froze and it froze very hard. And suddenly in 94 and 95, all of a sudden we get all these calls, we have crown gall everywhere. Tom Burr has made a career out of, out of, out of Cornell. It's still around, but we've learned how to deal with it. So that's what I call adapting on the fly. So in pest monitoring, we also had to take into climatic and, uh, the climatic indices. So the awareness of winter injury in crown gall, using selective pesticides that could control certain things, but not others. So now we had to start looking more at mixtures, finding the right blend of a couple of things. Resistance was rearing its head. They were being found more and more, not only in insects, but in multiple diseases. The other thing that came along were pesticide restrictions, and these were positives. Worker safety. No longer did we have the situation of spray, wait until it's dry, and then go do whatever you had to do. Suddenly now there were multiple hours before you could go in. Cultural practices had to change. Pre-harvest intervals were like that, so now we had to think about what was going on, as well as residue accumulations over an entire season. No one had thought about it, but in a very dry year, pesticide residues accumulate. So we had to get our mindset around, okay, how do we work with this to keep everything safe at the very end? Because things were showing up in wine at the end that we never really imagined. The dilemma we had was that everything on pesticide applications was based on fresh fruit and the harvest of the fruit, but not the processing. So we hadn't thought about accumulation potentials or degradation potentials in something that was being processed. And finally in the 90s, vinifera planting went full fledged on. Suddenly it was everywhere, at least within the Niagara Peninsula and parts of Southwest. But they, these were the things where it, it started to really go. The 2000s, I, I call that Y2K, which was 
You know, if you were a computer, computer geek at that time, that was to be the end of the world. All computers were supposed to crash because the clocks inside them weren't going to be able to adapt to the change over to the 2000s. Well, the world went forward. And I will tell you that grape growers and researchers realized all the computers in the world could crash, but grapes were still going to grow, pests were still going to be there, and we still had to work with it. So that, that was uh, what I call the, the thing. Suddenly in the 2000s, and this is probably the biggest one that, that I have personally faced, is what I call the invaders. <laughs> Suddenly something shows up that you've never seen before, ever. Worldwide literature is scarce. We don't know much. People really don't want to talk about it. <laughs> and now we're back to square one to figure out what is going on. It's really, it, it was the, the thing that, that I remember the most. The other part of the, the 2000s is what I call the return of the zombies. Suddenly we've got all these old pests that we had forgotten years and years about are now showing up again in greater amounts. Why? We had to start thinking about some of those. So we had to look at opportunity being revisited. What can we do differently? Yeah, it's a chance to learn something. It's a chance to grow and go forward. And I'm going to finish off a little bit with what I call the game changers and what, where we're going from there. Lady Beetle, Harmonia Axaritis Palace. I learned that name far too many times. Worked with Gary Pickering on multiple projects to try and figure out why is this critter a problem? When will this critter be a problem in vineyards? What propels it to show up in vineyards in the first place? What damage is it doing? Where will it show up next? We had nothing. We had no registered controls. And again, in Canada, when we look at it, to apply a pesticide to control a pest or an insect on a crop, it better be labeled on it or you can't use it. Zero. We had nothing. Why was it bad? What was it doing? It it's, fits in a family of, of insects that are beneficials. They're supposed to be the good guys. Well, this is like we jokingly refer to as the good bug gone bad. If anybody can remember, and I do remember the famous incident at what was at that time called Sky Dome, which is the Rogers Center, there was a massive influx of aphids that came in on a cloud and dropped and actually canceled a baseball game. You say, well, what does this have to do with grapes? Those aphids had been found on soybeans. This critter was feeding on those aphids. And what happens is that when its food source was gone, when the soybeans were harvested or drying down, its food was gone. And for some reason that no one can tell me with 100% accuracy, it suddenly decided that grapes and mature fruit, it was going to go find. Well, soybeans are harvested early in the fall. <laughs> grapes are there for a long time. This is like saying, OK, we're going to eliminate your food source. And now you take that ravenous horde and say, go find something else. This was my introduction to very intense work because my first uh, issue with this that when I noticed it was actually through uh, Chris Tatarnik in here, he walked in and told me the one day, he says, Kevin, what's with these bugs? I said, oh, what do you mean? He says, well, they, they, they smell like stinky peanut butter. Uh oh, and they were all over the grapes. He says, we're trying to make wine. And this, uh, that was, that was an introduction. You want to be caught blindsided. That's, that's the way to have it. The next one that came along after Lady Beetle, and we did learn a lot from it. And this is where Wendy, and as, as I put down the line, called the pathologist, came into play as sour rot. We were familiar with, with black rot. We were familiar with Botrytis bunch rot. Sour rot was a whole other creature that suddenly showed up on us because it was a multitude of organisms that were responsible. So now we're not fighting anything on one singular front, we're now looking at multiple fronts. There was the impact of insects that were causing wounding injuries potentially. Were they moving it from point to point, be it uh, Drosophila or, or other insects? Now, again, a new game changer. What were the triggers? Why did it show up? Where did it show up? I say thank you to the pathologists because they worked on stuff that I'm too used to. I'm an old school guy. I, I'm kind of the touch, feel, see, well, this is all down microscope level, uh, like biochemists and, and I, biochemists and pathologists. I say, you people imagine things that I 
when you're a touchy-feely guy, it's, it's hard to do. <laughs> so what do we do? How do we deal with it? Strategies were developed. So each time we were, we've been given a challenge, there have been a collective of people that have gone out and decided to work on it. Then the next wave that came along, as I call it, the new areas. Suddenly we're growing grapes in places that had not grown grapes before. And this brings a whole new concept. I will admit, at the very beginning, um, when I first started, the people that were in Vineland before me said, Vinifera will, ne and this is prior to me, Vinifera will never grow in Ontario. Oh, okay, if that's what you think. I came to Vineland, and when I got through and started working there, I said, no, I, 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 th I think, you know, if we can grow peaches, we can grow Vinifera grapes. And I remember a, a winery owner banging his phone when he talked to me. He says, am I talking to someone at Vineland? Because they said, I can't do this. Said, well, no, but it's going to be touch and go. So I thought, okay, Niagara, Southwest Ontario, peaches, et cetera, maybe, well, everybody decides they're going to be a grape grower in this province, it seemed. Prince Edward County goes crazy. But also now, if you notice on the map here, and, and to put it, so north, north of Prince Edward, we've got them all the way up through, through in Hastings. We have them around Ottawa. We have people up all around the Georgian Bay. We have Huron County going into it. We have people actually in London that are growing and just slightly north. So, but, and the incredible part was, which I surprised from years ago they had done it, was even the Simcoe area was now getting more and more into it. So with that, suddenly we're planting grapes in fields and, and land masses that had never seen grapes before. Maybe wild grapes on the periphery. But now people were calling in with, well, I'm running into this problem and that problem. I'd never really cut, run into cutworms before, but they were. Vegetable crops and all kinds of things that had been grown previously on the land, suddenly these opportunistic insects were appearing and going after them. At harvest, yellow jackets and wasps, which were a low priority issue in Niagara, suddenly were a big item, especially in Prince Edward County, but they were relying heavily on hand harvest. When you're on a grape harvester with a machine, you really don't notice the, the yellow jackets and the bees near as much as you do when you gotta go cut it by hand. In herbicide residues, I noticed in Southwest, people were calling and suddenly they had stunted vineyards. They were planting in after soybeans and corn had been used and some of the products had residuals that were fine if you followed up with the same crop, but the minute you went into something new and grapes were new, suddenly there was issues. So we have to take these things into account. So now your mindset changes. Strategies for pest control. How am I going to look for them? Where do I look for them? And then I talked earlier about the zombies reawakening. Sud knows and others suddenly know. Scale insects. Well, scale insects and mealybugs were never a problem when I first started. In fact, I was really hard pressed to find them. But then my brain, when they started to reappear and speaking with others, said, why are they showing up now? For many, many, many years, we relied on organophosphate insecticides. And it took absolute care of mealybugs and scale insects in grapes. In fact, ironically, that one of the products that was used for grape berry mouth control on grapes was labeled for mealybug. Well, we have the best mealybug control anywhere in the world. I can tell you that. But now when you go to selective products, these things start to come back. Phylloxera. People are now seeing phylloxera feeding on roots where they never thought they would see them. There's so many biotypes out there. There was a researcher from Australia came in and collected materials in Ontario and they found, I think they're up to now almost 60 different biotypes of phylloxera around the world. In other words, those that have adapted to the areas where they're growing. So far, we've been good. Our rootstocks and everything are holding up. But I suspect if we started to look at, we're going to find, we find the leaf eating form everywhere now a little more prevalent. I won't be surprised to find it the root feeding form. Maybe not to the point of damaging the vines and killing them like it did in other areas, but we have to watch. Mites have made a big comeback. Well, eight-legged creatures, spiders, are one of the most difficult uh, to control at, at even the best of times, so we have to watch for them. And when I talk to Wendy, she's getting calls about anthracnose. I bet you I haven't seen anthracnose in the first 35 years of my career more than twice. And now, suddenly, she's finding it in different spots. Why? Because the pesticides or the fungicides that were available to us are no longer really effective on some of these things, and they're coming back. 
Are they causing serious problems? No, but we have to be aware they're present. So what are the hot issues right now? Virus issues. I don't think there's a great grower in Ontario that it probably couldn't mention the word red blotch to you. For me, going through, I looked at, there was one years and years ago, it was called a gold leaf or flavescence doré. And I dealt with a pathologist out of, out of uh, Cornell and we'd only ever seen it twice type of thing. So it was one of these, it wasn't really hot on my button of, of observations. But we also misidentified, and I openly will admit it, suddenly the symptoms of viruses were very quickly being distinguished from those of nutrient deficiencies that we thought we had in the past. And I will take ownership on some of that because we hadn't really run into them. But those are buzzwords now, and we are looking at them, and people like Sue, and I'll have a slide in a bit to show you. Clean plant material. It's taken 40 years to finally get people back on board and realize that clean vines are the best way to start. We unfortunately back many years ago had a clean plant program. It was kind of let go by the boards because the cost per vine was significantly higher than that of importing vines. Well, we brought a lot of stuff in. And unfortunately, we were the architects of our own demise in that now we're paying the price and we have to go back and clean things up removing blocks, planting with new material and protecting. Uh, I worked actually in a, a controlled greenhouse at the research station in Vineland and my job was to go out and check for everything, but also we had to basically keep that greenhouse sterile. We never let an insect in. We had entry and exit points blocked off. It was, you were, you were under high degree of control, very much like they do in Sandington for plant quarantine. But that's where the nuclear material was kept. We knew it was clean and we could plant up mother blocks and we were, it was all set to sell to growers. Unfortunately, as I said, it was just one of the economics of the, of the time. I, I really wonder what would, where we'd be today if we had really embraced it to the degree we could have at that time of having really clean material in Ontario. The other one are new strategies, new materials, keeping up with the latest pesticides, uh, organic materials, oils, surfactants, other things that are out there. And we do have new pests on our doorstep, and the one that everybody's watching for is spotted lanternfly. Uh, every time I hear something creeping up the U.S., we had one a few years back, thank goodness it didn't become a big problem, was brown marmorated sink bug. They did have serious problems with it in Virginia, Maryland, and other ones with grapes. We never, it never seemed to become that here. Spotted lanternfly sounds a little bit, little bit different this time around. So this was the one that, that I always, you know, I'm lucky to, to be able to ask people for slides, <laughs> and Sud was a great one. And here, here's what's going on at Brock and realizing what's available to growers. The virus diagnostics, this is huge. This is, this is something when the virology started to go down at, at, at Vineland and the virology work was being done in BC, but we still needed help in Ontario, and now we've been able to get something up and get it going and make it available to growers at a reasonable price. This is, this is now, the type of thing that I, I can't help but promote to growers and saying, if you have the opportunity to get stuff tested that you suspect, do it. Don't fool around. This is, this is something that will, the more you try and block it out of your eyesight, the worse it is. The sooner you can organize and get, get ready for it, the better off you'll be. And so it's, it's these kind of things that I think we have to remember. So that's kind of where we have gotten to now, but where are we going? So I want to just do a little bit. This is kind of a, a, an incomplete list of things that, if you remember at the beginning, I listed five items, and now this is all the ones that, that we are actually routinely having to think about, not just sort of casually think about, but we have to be aware of them. And some of them are, are area specific, but others are not, but there's still a problem that we have to watch for, and that's what pest management, pest monitoring is. I, I joke, we don't really manage pests. They manage us. We just sort of try and find a way to, we, we adapt to whatever the pests are that are present. And the invaders, so what's ahead? If I get people, if I can come up with five things to kind of summarize where I want to get everybody mindset. Remember the past. Experience should never be dismissed as old school. I'm now old school. <laughs> I don't want to be dismissed, 
because I may be able to tell you something about something that you hadn't thought about. I was lucky enough to be near research mentors and had them as good friends that had 40, 50, 60 years of, of life experience. And I could ask them that question. Amazingly, when multicolored Asian lady beetle came to the forefront, a research scientist that I had known as a summer student was still alive. And he gave me pictures of him collecting multicolored Asian lady beetle in the late 1980s and sending them to Ottawa for identification. And he had picked up 22 different colors of beetles, sent them off, and they were all the same species. Suddenly, now we had an organism that could be almost, a, I don't know what you would call it, just basically, it was a ghost. It, it could take on any image that it seemed to want to. Two year early in North America, it was red, ba uh, red backing with black spots. Go to Asia, it was black backing with red spots. Explain that to me. I don't know. Be a mentor. And what I mean by be a mentor, be a friend. Don't ever think that you can't help someone, but also realize that at some point, uh, mentors are the ones that get us to where we can get moving forward. And think outside the box. I have to imagine the use of drones and imaging and all this spectral analysis that, that, that I'm too used to. My eyeballs have been so long in my head that, that I'm so used to that that now I have to rely on artificial technology to help, help assist me and never be afraid to ask. If you become afraid to ask the question, you will not get the answer. But ironically, my father told me this, if you ask the question, there's usually in a room five other people that would ask it but are scared to. And whether it's at a conference or anything, there is no reason to not. So learn from the past, lady beetle, botrytis, sour rot, mealy bug, virus, all of this is not really, really new. It's just something we hadn't thought about in great detail. Old dogs can learn from new tricks. Yeah, you can take us and what we thought originally might be the fit now is across a much bigger area. Low impact products, biological materials, timing of these things, how do they mix, how do they work? And then also the consideration now to a greater degree of organic and biodynamic principles. Maybe not the wholehearted system, but what are the concepts behind that we need to integrate into our thought process of realizing it's a big biological system. It's not just grapes in a vineyard. And be aware of the enemies on the horizon, as I call it. We're waiting nervously. Read. Find out what's going on nearby. Inevitably, things come from the south to the north. And it's not to say anything bad, but it's tradition. Pests migrate from warmer areas to colder areas. Well, as we warm up, things are going to start moving further and further north. What's happening in the, the east coast of the U.S. is suddenly going to migrate upwards. And we have to be ready for it. So what's next? The last part is, is a, a quick little plug that I'm going to put in here. So this is a picture of a Spitfire airplane. My dad flew Spitfires in World War II. And he did it as a 20-year-old. And one thing he told me, and I never forget, was I learned more from my failures than I ever did being successful on the first try. And it's very true. If you, you get it the first time through, you're never really sure what you did right. But if you make mistakes, you can learn and you can add to it. So never be afraid. Churchill, the courage to continue is what distinguishes success from failure. If we took every great pest that came at us and just threw up our hands, we wouldn't be where we are today. So we just have to keep plugging away. And the last part is, your true friends are your harshest or fiercest critics, but also the strongest defenders. You need somebody to tell you the truth. <laughs> Whether you want to hear it or not, you need to hear the truth. And if something doesn't work, and I know from doing outreach work with many, many growers, if it didn't work, I'm so thankful because they told me this just did not work. And maybe not in those polite terms, but it really helped me refocus because they would come up with criticism and suggestions of how to make it better. And the last one is, this is a picture of a Harvard airplane. Harvards were flown in World War II. This was a training airplane. My dad flew 1,000 hours of airtime in World War II. He did about 300 hours of teaching other pilots to fly these Harvards. He did it in Quebec. He did two tours of duty. My wife was a, a 
very sneaky person. So for my birthday last year, she got to Mount Hope. Mount Hope has these airplanes. On the 80th anniversary of my dad's first mission in North Africa, well, first successful mission, he shot down three measurements. So 80 years to the day, I got to go up in that plane. That's a mental rush, but it also told me to remember. So what I've remembered out of this is who led the way? It started for me with, with Ag Canada, HRIO, the University of Guelph, moving to Brock and working with Debbie and many other colleagues have been absolutely amazing. I've had my eyes opened and for anybody who goes through here or other institutions, walk in with open eyes and you'll walk away with great memories. I've had great growers, industry mentors, friends across the world and across Canada that have collaborated with me, along with me. I always feel that things you do with people, no one does it for someone, you do it with someone. And I always remember that. And the last two are Wendy and Ryan. Wendy's been doing it. Well, I met Wendy in graduate school. Now, she's been just a few years less than me in the grape industry. And we took a statistics course together and she'll never forget that one or ever let me forget it. And Ryan Brewster is a, actually a Brock grad, came to me as a summer student uh, when I started my business and he never left. He now runs his own business. He's taken over pretty much everything. So as they call and mention it, it's the passing of the torch and passing along of information and the passing along of connections that you embrace, you start with, you embrace, and then you realize, man, these people know an awful lot and I still will always ask other people for information because they just know so much more than me. So with that, I will finish and take questions. I think we're almost, I might be right on time. This has been novel for me to get back in the saddle for lectures, but uh, if there's any questions, feel free to ask. Kevin, um, you mentioned that you have a would it be fair to say that in truth that this 50 year um, you know, span that you walked us through, which was a, a great overview today, thank you for that, um, that really the power of collaboration had, to me seems to resonate that that has made us more competitive and resilient going forward. It, would you, would you say that would be a, a take-home message here? That the, the collaboration, I, the collaboration, as I call it, the collaboration without uh, restriction. In other words, for a while, and I would say this for a while, there were people worried about their, their little bits of turf. And so things got kind of into what I call little mini silos. Well, the silos are gone now. And I was lucky to see a very early stage of what working out in a non-silo environment with everybody that I could walk down a hall, knock on a door as an undergraduate student or as a summer student to a PhD in virology and say, I don't know what this is. And they would take the time to talk to me. It's, that's the part, that's the, the incredible nature of collaboration because we have to look at the big picture and having someone that can look at the big picture and help you paint and little parts on that picture to add to it, suddenly you know, you see images that you never saw before. And, and that was what I remember the most. And yes, you're right, it, it's made us very resilient. We can have an incredibly hard winter hit us, but over time, through working with a number of people, we've been able to solve things. It doesn't make them perfect, but boy, it gives us the opportunity to, to collectively brainstorm, and it's the singular idea and that's where I'm coming back to your fiercest critics as strongest defenders. The people that make you solve it will also help you along your way to be the staunchest supporter. My dad had what the, he called the seven rules. Seven rules of success, seven rules of, or seven reasons for success, seven reasons for failure. So if you said to somebody, no, you can't do this, you had to have seven solid reasons why it won't work. If you don't, you haven't looked at it from enough different directions. Similarly, if someone suddenly said, I'm gonna do this because of, okay, give me the seven solid reasons of why this will work. Okay, if you only have a few, you need to add to that. So it's the same thing here. Uh, I look at for pest management, for grape growing, it's the big picture. And rarely do you ever get the seven. My father never told me that. Rarely do you ever get to seven. 
he said, if you get to, you know, and at the very end, towards the end, he would say, if you get to five, you're doing really well. But at least it stops you to think that after the first go at it, you maybe haven't addressed it from all the different directions. And people will say, well, we've always done it that way. No, nope. very good friend, a good grape grower was very successful doing something, particular strategy for managing the vines. And people came up to him afterwards and, and he said, you know, I just, he says, I was too stupid to know that I wasn't supposed to be able to succeed. I was too stupid to know I was not supposed to succeed. It worked, but he looked at it from a different angle. So sometimes that's, that's, I agree with you. I think, don't be afraid. That's where I'm coming back. Don't be afraid to ask of others to help you uh, look at things and, and be collaborative, collegial, and helpful. It, it's all of us get ahead. Nobody's left behind. Some may be more successful than others, but yeah, it, it is the cornerstone of all of it. Are there any other questions? Sue. Uh, my question is that, you know, to connect the, the medieval populations coming back after the use of the um, fast pace or our neonic or nights, um, but also um, to connect that to the biological as it things yep. like that. Do you think that uh, it took less time for mini bugs to come back than biological? Very, again, the question is, are, did the natural predators or parasites um, take a harder hit from pesticide use than the pests that we're dealing with? Very much so, very much so. We know that most, and, and part of it's also understanding population dynamics of you have to have lots of prey there to feed upon before you can build your own population up and then eventually it will crash. I mean, those are the, the standard population curves. But yes, they, they were affected by much lower levels of pesticide presence and possibly the carryover of that impacted them to a greater degree because I think secondarily the broad spectrums took out, they may have had a wider host range than we imagined, but we were killing out those hosts as well as our primary target. So it decimated them to even a greater degree. I think there's room to bring them back, but now we just have to learn as to if, if left alone in an unfettered ecosystem, how does it find its balance? But we also have to consider it under the, the grapevine. Sometimes we can't wait that long for the beneficial to catch up <laughs> because by then it's already done enough damage. And so we do have that, that balancing act that we have to look at. But I think it's there. People looked at companion plantings, all kinds of things that are out there now that we had known about, forgotten, and now we're coming back to learning again. Uh, this is about you know, the policy change. Uh, I know you talked about the you know, 1990s, or 19, beginning from the 1980s or 1990s, when the, the replant program happened, how the governments are involved Supporting the growers yep. in the street plant program, replacing the whole media. Do we think there is a gap between now and then? Because now we are dealing with uh, uh, almost natural disasters like relief or the red uh, for example, or something else coming up. Uh, do you think that there is a gap in the policy changes? From there, the, 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 bigger different, the biggest difference now is that at that time, um, the economic impact, I think, was was much better understood because it was an all or none. It was literally a light switch there. Turn the light off in 1988. And something I don't have a home for a few, you know, thousands and thousands of acres of grapes. Now what do we do? So growers, the interesting part to remember about this is growers were compensated for the pull-out program, but they were not paid to replant. It was the growers who took that leap of faith to take that money and reinvest it into the land, into the new varieties. So that's, that's a little different policy than right now where growers are struggling because we have vineyards blocks that are, are having to be removed. I think we have to sort of look at what happened with the peach industry when it came along with certain things and the virus issue with them. And they said, no, no, we're, we got to compensate you to pull these blocks out because they're a problem. I think similarly in grapes, if there's a way to assist the growers, but the big thing is to assist in the right way. And from my perspective, it's clean plant material. 
don't just throw money and say replant. It's got to be have some strings attached to it to tell you, no, put in better plants, right? And I, I think you would agree with that, that we can't just haphazardly say replace. We have to say replace with better. So, yeah, we have to keep knocking on the door with the policy people, but that I, I think there's opportunity. Uh, please join me in thanking Kevin for, <laughs> Kevin, for you, another favorite oh, person. Perfect, perfect. <laughs> and uh, uh, just a reminder that our lecture series will pause next week because it's reading week uh, here at the university, uh, and many of us are involved in the Ontario Fruit and Vegetable Convention. Uh, but we'll resume on March 1st with a presentation focused on brand stories um, on social media from Goodman School of Business Assistant Professor Dr. Joachim Schultz. So uh, we look forward to seeing you either in person or online or catch the lecture a little bit later when we post it on the Kirby website. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye.